working remotely and everything is just, you know, zoom, zoom, zoom. Yeah. I'm doing a, a panel on uh, a monetary policy conference next month, and it's just good I evening, everyone. What a beautiful crowd we have real, tonight! But it's, I think maybe because of all the planning that would go into changing, it's yeah. still all Zoom. I'm gonna yeah. encourage you to take your seats. Nobody wants to sit up front. It's always that thing. Welcome, everyone. We're really glad that you're here. Just so you know where you're at. You're at the 2021 William R. and Linda K. Cotter debate series. Tonight's debate topic is fed up. Should the Federal Reserve be responsible for addressing economic inequality? My name is Kimberly Flowers and I am the executive director of the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs. We are proud to be doing this in collaboration with the economics department. And I want to tell you a little bit first about why this is called the Cotter Debates. So this was established as a debate series in 1999, and it's to honor the legacy of Bill Cotter and his wife, Linda. And Bill Cotter was uh, Colby's 18th president. He was president from 1979 to 2000. He was the longest serving president of all time at Colby College. I have not met Bill, but I have heard many things about him in my short year and a half here. Um, he was beloved, he and his wife quite beloved. In the time that he was here, more than 20 buildings were erected. I think we have a lot of construction going on now, imagine that. Um, also, there were more than 30 endowed faculty chairs during his time here. Um, he also increased the study abroad program participation and helped diversify the student body and faculty. Um, when I was doing a little homework on him, I think the piece that stood out to me was that he more than doubled the percent percentage of tenure track female professors. He was also known as the president who ended the fraternity system here at Colby. I'm not going to say a lot about his career. Um, I'll just say that he focused a lot on um, international um, and governance programming. He spent time in Nigeria, Colombia, Venezuela. He was also a White House fellow under Lyndon Johnson. So I think I personally, since I've spent a lot of time overseas, would have really appreciated working under him. He also, before he came to Colby, was the president of the African American Institute. But one of the things that Bill Cotter loved was a good, healthy debate, was people with two diverse opinions coming together and respectfully disagreeing or sorting out their different points. And I don't need to tell you how much we certainly need that in today's world. And that's also something that the Goldfarb Center, in particular Bill Goldfarb, um, we take a, at the core of our value and our mission is to bring together different opinions because all opinions are so important to understand and we respectfully can disagree. I saw a tagline the other day from an organization that great minds don't always think alike. Um, very true. So tonight I want to first thank Professor Rob Lester. Thank you, Rob, for working on this topic, creating it, getting the speakers together, and for especially moderating this evening's discussion. Rob is an associate professor of economics here. He's also part of the Goldvard Faculty Advisory Committee. Committee. He came to Colby in 2015 from Notre Dame and is a prolific publisher and teaches uh, currently a macroeconomic theory class, an American dream and American worker class, as well as a seminar on growth and work of nations. I am curious in the audience, how many of you are students of Professor Lester? Yep, yep that's right, fantastic. We're so glad you're all here. Um, I think you're also the faculty liaison to the track team? And football. And football, okay. Uh -huh. Any track or football people in the audience? Yep. Yep, right there in the front. Awesome, fantastic, and in the back. Um, before I turn it over to Rob, I just want to make one quick announcement. Um, next Thursday, this time, this place, um, same time, same place is what I mean to say, um, we are going to have our guest, fe guest speaker, Nadine Strosen. Uh, we're going to be talking about free speech, which is the theme for the Goldfarb Center this year. It's going to be a phenomenal event. You're not going to want to miss it. I, I really want to emphasize that. She's a powerhouse. Um, she's a constitutional lawyer, former ACLU, first female president, um, but she has just written a book on hate speech 
And it's really gonna be a primer, very conversational, and everything from talking about protests, free speech on campus, you know, hate speech online. So if that topic interests you, that'll be sort of the kickoff to a lot of programming that we're gonna be having this year on free speech. Thank you all for coming. Rob, over to you. Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> I forgot to make an announcement. This is not live streamed tonight, but it is recorded. So if you need to get up to leave early for some reason, don't walk right in front of the camera and the nice cameraman in the back. Please duck underneath. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly, for that introduction. And for uh, my students here tonight, a quick update. There's a sign-up sheet on the back, uh, back <laughs> so you can, you can prove yourselves uh, that you're here. OK, now down to business. Stable prices and full employment. Since 1977, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee has set interest rates to achieve these two objectives. But is it time to update the Fed's mandate? In particular, should the Fed reduce economic inequality? This is what we're here to discuss tonight. Joining me on stage are two leading experts on monetary policy in the Federal Reserve. To my left, Paul Wachtel. Paul is Professor Emeritus of Economics at New York University Stern School of Business. Paul's research touches on economic growth, monetary policy, and central bank independence. He was a co-editor of Comparative Economic Studies as the associate editor of the Journal of Banking and Finance. And to my further left, Karen Petro. Karen is the co-founder and managing partner of Federal Financial Analytics, a privately held company that provides analytical and advisory services on legislative, regulatory, and public policy issues affecting financial service companies doing business in the U.S. and abroad. She is also the author of Engine of Inequality, The Fed and the Future of Wealth in America. Karen is regularly quoted as an expert on banking policy and a range of newspaper outlets from the Wall Street Journal to Bloomberg, and has testified before the U.S. Congress, as well as several regional banks in the Federal Reserve System. So please join me in welcoming our two exceptionally productive speakers tonight. <laughs> Okay, so to get started, uh, Karen, I'm going to address the first question to you because you, you just wrote the book on this. Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how the Fed has affected inequality and what, what sorts of inequality are you thinking of? Income, wealth, consumption, what are you thinking of? Well, I think it's important to start with what, what's the Fed because at dinner this, uh, this evening, I think many students aren't aware of that. The Fed is the nation's central bank. And that means it's not a bank like Citibank or a Bank of America. It's an, an arm of the government, but it's independent. And it is supposed to set monetary policy, which used to mean basically what, how much money there was in the money, so how much money was flowing through the economy, and what the rate of interest is on that. And it used to do that through what are called open market operations in which it played a very limited role in the economy, changing the way bank reserves flowed, the cost of bank reserves. And when the cost of money to banks changed for the up or down, interest rates moved, and the economy theoretically and often did change. And it's a very limited function. Um, largely ignored by all but the financial markets and presidents right before the election when interest rates mattered. But bit by bit, particularly after the tremendous inflation experience of the late 70s and early 80s, central banking has become more and more of the force in the American economy and particularly in our financial markets. And that makes it a powerful engine for either equality or inequality, because what is economic inequality? It's money, it's about money. This is not about how fair a society is, it's obviously linked to it. It's not about how happy a society or how healthy, it's about who has the money. And there are two government agencies for moving money. One is the central bank, and the other is the US Congress. And the US Congress sets something called fiscal policy by virtue of how it sets taxes and how it decides 
um, federal spending, whether it spends money on infrastructure or social welfare or cuts taxes. These are powerful economic equality forces because, again, it moves the money. In my book, I try to talk about how the Fed is an engine of inequality because there's been a tremendous amount of focus over many years on fiscal policy, particularly tax policy. But it's been little noticed how much the Fed as basically the money bank for the economy and particularly since 2008, also the decider of rules for the biggest banks, it sets financial policy. And it has set that in hopes of a broad-based economy. The Fed is not evil. It doesn't want to make inequality worse. But it's been so focused on financial markets and on banks' profitability and stability that we have seen economic inequality spike enormously. After 2010, after the great financial crisis, the U.S. became more unequal faster than ever. And nothing changed as much as financial, monetary, and regulatory policy after 2010. Nothing changed as much and nothing changed as fast. And that's a, a role I think the Fed plays in economic inequality. It's not the sole force of inequality, but it's a powerful one and one not well understood. I'd finally say it's also one, unlike Congress, which is in a state of complete dysfunction, Unlike much of our government, the Fed, if it understood its role, could change it and make a really positive difference without the stroke of a single legislative pen. It's one of the easiest ways to reduce economic inequality. Will it cure it? No. Will it help it? Yes. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and so o over to Paul. Paul, I know. Uh, so there's a, a working paper you have with some co-authors that I paid particular attention to about some of the trade-offs of different dimensions of inequality. If you're think, thinking of like income or wealth, and if you're thinking about different points of the distribution or racial inequality or equality, uh, can you speak to that a little bit and give us a clue on what the Fed's <clears throat> doing? Okay, let me step back just a bit uh, and address the whole issue of. Uh, income and wealth inequality in this country generally. Uh, because where I differ with Karen a bit is I view the trends in inequality as being a little bit more long-term and really coming about from developments in what economists call the real sector, what's going on in the economy itself. Um, Inequality reduced in this country in the first couple of decades after the Second World War substantially. Um, and those were optimistic years. Those were years in which uh, there was increasing confidence in the uh, state of the American economy, in faith in the American way, in the American system. Uh, it was capped by things like civil rights legislation and the expansion of the social safety network uh, during the Johnson administration. Uh, and then things began to reverse a bit. Um, I remember those years, the 70s, the 80s, and I remember arguing erroneously uh, to, uh, in front of a classroom, uh, saying, oh, this reversal is just a blip. You know, it's sort of a cyclical kind of thing. It's going to disappear. It did disappear. Uh, inequality increased step by step by step for 40 years following, say, the late 70s, early 80s. Why? Well, lots of good things were happening, which had the uh, consequence of increasing economic inequality. Globalization, uh, the, the fact that um, the spread of manufacturing around the world increased the standard of living in many developing emerging market economies, but at the same time reduced the, reduced the demand for manufacturing labor in this country. And so wages for many unskilled types of professions 
or relatively unskilled types of professions began to fall relative to others. Changes in technology, more, more sophisticated technology required more education on the part of workers. So the relative wages of well-educated workers compared to less well-educated workers began to widen. It was the well-educated workers who could confront and exploit and use new technology. They became relatively more valuable. As a consequence, inequality widened. Um, communication, making enormous uh, uh, markets. Uh, I always give the example of um, baseball players today are paid a lot more than Babe Ruth was by any measure because Babe Ruth could only play in a one market, Yankee Stadium. Maybe it went to the radio stations in New York who could broadcast 100 miles. Any kind of sports figure today is playing in a global market and that makes the returns to excellence much higher. You know, stars and Cracker Jacks get enormous returns. That leads to growing inequality. But these have nothing to do with monetary policy. Uh, they might be things we might want to offset, but by and large, they reflect changes in society which have made us all better off, increased productivity, globalization, increased trade, have made us better off over time, even if the consequence is uh, more inequality. So in my view, the Fed plays a uh, relatively minor role in this 50-year trend, but it does play a role. Uh, as it has pursued its goals of um, low inflation and relatively full employment, uh, in the last 20 years, that the years Karen was talking about, it has not been worried about inflation. Matter of fact, if anything, it was more worried about the one thing in the world that is worse than inflation, which is deflation. And it has very vigorously pursued its overall employment goals. And in doing so, has had some effects which have, in fact, worsened inequality. Uh, and let me just point them out quickly. As the Fed pursues a rapidly growing economy, uh, there are some good things with respect to inequality. The research that uh, Rob point, referred to is a paper I finished uh, late last year with some co-authors, uh, which showed, uh, which, which addressed racial inequality, and showed that um, as the economy, as the overall unemployment rate goes down, the gap between the unemployment rate of black workers and white workers declines. Black workers gain more in terms of the overall unemployment rate in the black community than do white workers. Well, as a consequence, the racial income gap goes down as the Fed vigorously pursues full employment. That's a good consequence. Everybody's pleased with that. But the fact of the matter is, it's not enormous. It doesn't really reduce the amount of black-white income inequality by very much. At the same time, this vigorously expansive monetary policy has helped fuel increases in asset prices primarily housing and equities. The median black household doesn't own any equities. The median black household doesn't even own a house. Home ownership in the black, amongst black households is less than 50% of all black households. So those capital gains on housing and equities, which increase wealth, don't accrue 
to a great extent to black households, they do accrue to white households. And to go beyond that one paper that we wrote, to, to expand it, capital gains coming about or being influenced by monetary policy benefit homeowners and owners of equities. Who are those people? The people who are already more wealthy. So as a consequence, the monetary policy of the last couple of decades has contributed to widening the inequality of, of wealth. Great, thanks Paul. And I, so I want to then zero in on uh, this portfolio composition effect that um, say different types of people in the economy own different uh, own different uh, assets. You know, some people own houses, some people own more on stocks. And so, Karen, I want I want to bring this back to you, and to think about. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the Fed's policy has changed, either since the Great Recession or COVID or both? Because there's been a lot going on since 2008, and how that's affected inequality through the financial markets or through some other channel. Well, I, I, th I think it's very interesting to see in, in, in 2008, the Fed dropped interest rates to unprecedented levels and for the very first time began something called quantitative easing, which meant that it started buying assets, um, trillions of dollars of assets from the financial system, thinking that that would stoke growth. And what it really did was stoke market equity market, yield chasing, which is the behavior that investors follow when um, they're seeking return and they can't earn it in safe assets, like treasury obligations, because the Fed owns so many of them. They start doing much more speculative things. Um, and these days, you see a lot of that demand in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. People are chasing returns because the impact of Fed policy with rates that are below, infl that have been below real zero in terms of the ad inflation adjusted rate for almost all of the 2010 through 20 peri um, 2020 period and certainly post 2020, if you put your money in the bank, you lose. Right now, the average savings rate at a bank is six basis points. Inflation last month was 5.3 percentage points, 5.3%. So you lose 4.7% savings. So you really drive markets up. And as Paul said, you very few lower, middle, moderate, and low income households hold any significant amounts of wealth, if, let alone any wealth in the stock. The majority of Americans, households below the 60% median income rate, have more debt than assets. So maybe you would think that lowering the cost of debt might help them if they were homeowners. But most homeowners, um, particularly now as house prices have appreciated so dramatically, are white and older. So again, low interest rates that permit a lot of people, maybe many of your parents to refinance their mortgages, get some cash out of the house, that's all great. But it's not driving a shared economy. So since March of 2020, what we've seen is what people are calling a K-shaped recovery. You saw that most dramatically perhaps in April of 2020, because after the Fed stepped in in March when the pandemic hit, the economy stopped and it was a true macroeconomic shock the Fed threw trillions into places it had never ventured before. The corporate bond market, it rescued the money market funds, it supported various aspects of the banking system it had never touched before, and what happened? The same day in April where deaths in America from COVID reached a then unprecedented number, the stock S&P index reached an unprecedented gain. The market fundamentals have, market returns have so now divorced from economic fundamentals that those who are not able to profit from them back to the portfolio composition are left farther and farther behind. This might be okay, sort of, if capital formation through the equity markets generated growth through employment, but it isn't gets to another point of what's been going on. Because when you have ultra low rates, 
Companies aren't investing in plants and equipment. The globalization and trade factors also contribute to this. And so you've seen tremendous amount. Our economy is now what many of you know is a financialized one in which money chases money and therefore those who have it do better than ever and those who don't do worse. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to pick up on that, and this could be to either Karen or Paul, but if we think about the Fed's policy, say since 2008, zeroing in on quantitative easing, et cetera, and we thought about the counterfactual where there was no quantitative easing, it was just business as usual. So perhaps inequality doesn't increase, but would the, would the median worker or the median person prefer to live in the world without quantitative easing and without these new Fed policies in 2008? Well, let me step back a bit and point out where this quantitative easing came from. Um, from the era of the Depression, uh, where there was extensive financial crises in this country, bank failures, which worsened the Depression uh, and kept the economy from recovering for a long period of time, uh, at a period of time for which the Fed was probably doing the wrong thing because they did not know any better uh, at, in the 1930s. Uh, we emerged from the Depression during the war. We emerged from the Second World War into a, several decades of, um, uh, of uh, economic growth and prosperity where the financial system was able to avoid any serious crises. There were a few. Um, you know, uh, First Continental Illinois, the major bank in Illinois that went bankrupt, uh, savings and loan crisis, which was very costly, but not crises which threatened the operation of the financial system. So in that sense, the 2008-2009 financial crisis was really unique. And it required an enormous uh, effort to jump in to avoid a financial panic which would really cripple the economy to a much greater extent than the actual recession that occurred. Financial system is, can, can be criticized in many, many, many respects. The financialization, the size of the financial system as a part of our economy is enormously overblown. Uh, it, 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 and it's probably something we haven't quite figured out how to change. That said, we need the financial system. We need the financial system to make sure that payments work, that financial transactions occur, that people have confidence in their holdings of money and any other financial assets. Basically, that's why we have central banks. Central banks predate all this discussion of, of inflation and employment goals. Those only emerged in a post-World War II period. Central banks go back several hundred years, but the, the, the idea of central banking really is a 19th century idea that the central bank is what was called the lender of last resort. To step in, to provide funds to the financial system, to make sure that the financial system continues to operate, to oil the wheels and keep things going so the economy doesn't melt down. Well, that's how the Fed came into existence in, 19, you know, in 1914 as a response to the financial crisis of 1906, uh, in where, the, where the financial system came very, very close to melting down. Well, that also is true in 2008. Uh, you, you know, uh, I think, and when I think back to, to what I thought was going on at that time, I really underestimated the extent to which the financial system came to the precipice of melting down, which would have been terrible for the global economy, and how the Fed, working with the government, really stepped in to do some extraordinary responses to stem this panic. 
and it has succeeded in doing so. And part of that was providing liquidity to the financial markets, introducing this whole notion of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing was also a way of providing money to the economy without, when the ability to reduce interest rates was restricted by the fact that the short-term interest rates had dropped essentially to zero. And as I said earlier, economists, central bankers love terminology for everything. They needed QE because of ZLB. That is, they needed quantitative easing to purchase assets directly because they'd reached the zero lower bound for interest rates. And the depth of that recession, that recession was pretty deep, and its quantitative easing was a panic response. But it was generally viewed as being an exception. This was extraordinary. This was an extraordinary 100-year flood uh, which was occurring, which required this extraordinary response. Well, it took the Fed a couple of years to come to that realization, but by a couple of years later, they were reducing the quantitative easing, it tapered down, and even began to increase interest rates. But then about 10 years later, another 100-year flood occurred, uh, which was the pandemic, where once again, the economy so, sort of dropped, the real sector dropped through the bottom as the economy, physical economy, closed down, and the government and the Fed worked together to provide the money, the resources, to keep the economy rolling along. And we entered another phase of quantitative easing, which continues uh, until this day. Now, as panic responses, in both instances, I think that the quantitative easing programs were beneficial to stemming the panic and helping the economy recover. But on the other hand, I fear that 100-year floods might start coming every year, and it might become commonplace to have these panic responses and Quantitative easing is a tool that can be readily abused, and we have to be careful not to do so. And I worry about that. Great, thanks, Paul. And so, Karen, I guess I, I kick this back to you. And I guess going back to my counterfactual question, would would if I'm the median worker, do I prefer to live in the society where there was QE in 2008, despite the increase in inequality? Like if if there's no QE, does the financial system melt down and we're looking at Great Depression levels of unemployment, or would we have hummed along without QE? Oh, I don't think there's any question that no one agree with completely with Paul. Financial crises are a really, they call the crises because they're a really bad idea. They destroy, they do a great deal of financial and macroeconomic damage, and that's um, destructive across the economic uh, distribution. The real question is how long does the Fed stay in the market? And the lender of last resort function in uh, classic central banking budget theory is supposed to be a very limited function supporting only sound institutions at penalty cost. And the, the emergency support is supposed to end when the emergency ends. What I think is problematic about the Fed in 2008 is not what it did in 2008, it's what it did in 2010 when it didn't begin to pull back. The problem with the Fed in 2020 is not what it did in 2020, although I dif disagree strongly with the nature of the massive backstops it provided. I, still, I, I proposed something at the time called the family financial facility. I am not the least bit sure why the Fed felt it necessary to step in for junk bond exchange traded funds and not support families that were in at least as acute liquidity strain. But the fact is the Fed prevented a financial crisis, whether the first time around I think very well, the second time around not so well, but we didn't have a crisis. But then in both cases, in 2010, the Fed should have stepped back. And in fact, it meant to. If you look at the minutes of the Federal Open Market Committee, 
When it started quantitative easing, the Fed was very divided about it, very nervous about it, and it really felt that as soon as the Fed could, quote, taper, it should. And the Fed, in fact, tried to do that in 2013. The markets responded adversely. With a, a, a correction, not a crisis, but a correction scared the Fed, and the Fed kept its, its portfolio at very high rates until it tried some tapering in 2017, 2018. Importantly, a BAS study, Bank for International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks, looked at exactly that question, not what happened with, we looked at QE and showed that the various QE1, QE2, QE3 in 2008, 2009, even through 2010, were beneficial to the economy. But after 2010 and through 2016, it flipped. And the overall impact of quantitative easing on the American economy did 10 times more for equities than it did for output. So you saw a policy that continued past the point of crisis because the Fed had dug itself into the market in such a big way it was unable to extricate itself. And the markets, of course, profited from that. That's what markets do. And the economy didn't benefit from it, not sustainably and not significantly. I think the data there are quite clear. Excellent. So Karen, I want to go back to one thing you said though about the perhaps like some sort of a family policy for the Fed or family fund for supporting families. And usually I think about something like family policy or even income redistribution as the channel of fiscal policy rather than monetary policy. So what would the advantage be of uh, taking care of some of those inequality issues related to family policy or anything else with the Fed taking care of it rather than, than the politicians that we elect? Well, I don't think of that as fiscal policy. I think it's a question of when the Fed steps in to provide emergency liquidity support, I think the question is for whom? If fiscal policy are issues like child care supports, infrastructure, spending or t taxing, but cr investing in the government. I'm talking about what happens, particularly in a financial crisis? Wh who does one help? Now, the, the Fed theoretically works through the banking system because that's the whole construct of traditional monetary policy. Lender of last resort was supposed to be the banks, and banks are heavily regulated. The idea of discount window support, which used to be the only loans of last resort that central banks provided, went only to banks because banks were heavily regulated in return for the privilege of, being, of having access both to the, the lender of last resort function and the payment system, which the Fed um, essentially and then in 1980 directly controlled. But the financial system for a variety of reasons, partly drawn of monetary policy and the reg rules, now is quote, shadow banking dominates credit in the United States, money market funds, private equity funds, a whole raft of non-bank institutions are at least as systemic as the biggest banks. And so the Fed in 2010 worked as a, not just lender of last resort to money market funds and exchange traded funds and corporate bond issuers. It was also the market maker of last resort across a spectrum of unregulated institutions. And this creates something I hope you all are studying called moral hazard. It's a really important aspect of our financial markets, validated in 2008 and in 2020, which is you can take any risks you want because the Fed will, will bail you out. And so, of course, you will be speculative. Of course, risk premium will drop because why not? Markets become increasingly speculative because the Fed supports them. S some of the financial crisis in t t 2020 was due to the tremendous macroeconomic shock. There's no question about that. That would have been great. Was the magnitude of the crisis in financial markets as large as it was because the pandemic shock was as great as it was, or because were markets so highly leveraged, so undercapitalized, and so illiquid based on moral hazard that they, da they, they literally were at the edge of a precipice and, and the pandemic pushed them over? Now, we're gonna need a lot more study to answer that question, but I think it's at least important to recognize that the Fed threw trillions into an, a financial system partly of its own creation 
because it had, through 2010, driven markets up so high and changed the nature of banking through an array of rules that the system worked very, very differently and far more precariously. So I think the counterfactual has to look not, Rob, at what happened in 2008 or 2020, but what happened since? Mm -hmm. What should the Fed have done after the crisis? And how could it, the actions in 2010 through 2020 mitigated the crisis we had in 2020? And what should the Fed be doing now in 2021 as our K-shaped recovery puts more and more strain on more and more families? I think that's the question of, of our time, and it's a really serious one because Americans, as Paul said, as we all saw in 2016, I fear we're going to see again in 2022 and 24. People are really angry, and they're right. Because no matter how hard they work, they're not getting ahead. Our intergenerational mobility is sliding backwards very, very fast. Only folks born with something end up with anything, and that's not right. Thanks, Karen. Paul, do you want to say something? Yeah, I would add a bit. Uh, you know, there's lots we agree on and lots we disagree on. I'm also puzzled about why the Fed was so committed to this quantitative easing that it seemed incapable of, understand, uh, of, of, of stepping back earlier, both in the uh, recession after the uh, 2008 and, and right now. Um, the emphasis on the aggregate employment goals uh, is, has been deleterious, is, 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 has not led the Fed in the right direction sometimes. And I think we're seeing that now with regard to inflation. The emphasis on the employment, the aggregate employment goals and the readiness to diminish the threat of inflation coming about from financial market expansion puzzled me in the last year because as the Fed continued to talk about inflation through the spring and summer as being just a blip that would go away related to some supply side issues, completely transitory, they didn't think that inflation would reach the 5% level that it's at now or stay there. And they were just too, too quick for some very sophisticated people they seem too quick to diminish those possibilities. So I think there have been a great deal of policy mistakes. Uh, on the other hand, I think you, all, you can't really blame the Fed for the structural changes in a dynamic financial system. Uh, the development of new non-bank institutions, uh, both, both due to new technology in the financial sector and to innovation in the financial sector has served the American economy well in terms of channeling funds to worthwhile investment activities, but has also expanded the financial system and enabled the financial system to sometimes evade the existing regulatory structure. But then again, the Fed has regulatory tools which were beefed up by the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010 after the, after the financial crisis. But their tools were beefed up by that Dodd-Frank Act. But the uh, Trump, just as they were getting those tools moving in some respects, the Trump administration entered and sort of pulled back, and those tools were not used to the extent to which they should have been coming up to the pandemic. And as you said, Karen, therefore making the uh, pan pandemic financial crisis more of a crisis uh, than, it, than it might have been otherwise. Uh, the Fed doesn't move as quickly as it might in many respects and sometimes its hands are tied by the influence on both the Fed and other financial sector regulators. The Fed is only one of a whole handful of institutions that regulate the financial sector. 
the SEC, the FDIC, the, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, the, but those institutions are often overly influenced by um, lobbyists of the, from the financial set industry itself who have a great deal of influence over regula regulation writing by all of those institutions and not always to, not always to the benefit uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the public. Uh, so there are lots of mistakes. Regulation not used as much as it ought to be. Uh, actual monetary policy probably lingering around longer than it should be with, with quantitative easing. Uh, and um, there's going to be a lot of analysis, you know, over time to see uh, how poorly we responded uh, in the in the aftermath of both the 2008-2009 crisis and the aftermath of the current, uh, you know, pa pandemic crisis. Great, thanks. Uh, so. I, I do want to get uh, sort of concrete on the last bit of questions that I have because I'm going to leave time for audience Q&A. So for to acknowledge the Fed's mistakes and as assume no more mistakes going forward, which is absurd, right, because the, <laughs> there will be mistakes, um, let's say the Fed starts to think about inequality. Uh, what, what outcome is it looking at? Is it looking at like a 99th percentile to first percentile, 90th to 50th income or wealth? Like, what's the metric? And then what's the instrument? So, Karen, I'll, I'll start with you. Well, when I was working on my book, the publisher said basically, the editor said, this is great. You can't just talk about the Fed as the engine of inequality. You have to have solutions. I said, damn, that's harder. Uh, and you've asked that, that hard question. I don't think you can quantify the answer. Um, I think you have to look at the structure of monetary policy. So the last chapter of my book is, is about ways to, I think, realign monetary policy. And we have to be very careful and gradual because um, the Fed is now such a huge player in the economy that any, you know, any sudden movements could be dangerous. But there are several steps. I think one and Paul, you've alluded, that the Fed has been making policy based on aggregate data and averages. And that used to work. When I went to graduate school, it, it made sense. The United States was a largely middle class country and the aggregates and averages were good representations. We had the representative agent model of thinking about the economy, which is you just, that person was a pretty good representation, the average for how the economy worked. Now, and I think there's a great deal of very constructive economics thinking about heterogeneous models, the United States and many other countries, we are not. Representative agent thinking distorts not the way the economy works, and as a result, the Fed has consistently missed the mark, congratulating itself on the economy being a, quote, good place in 2015, where most Americans felt it was anything but and voted that way in 2016. It, it's a sort of geeky equality solution, but I think it's really critical because you, you can't have good policy with bad data. We have to fix the data. We have to move away from representative agent data and modeling to much more heterogeneous analysis. We need to begin to normalize interest rates. We have a vicious cycle between economic inequality, particularly income inequality, and ultra low rates. And I go back to what I said about savings. Most Americans, you can't, if you can't save for your future, you don't have an economic future. Where is your retirement? Where is your down payment? Where are the funds for putting your kids through college without enormous debt? Putting money into the equity markets is very hard for most people. It's a, comp it's a complex proposition for which many Americans lack both the confidence and the education. Savings is a critical engine of wealth equality, and we need to start to remove, reduce interest rates, to raise interest rates to a reasonable, real return above inflation so that savings begins again 
to grow the economy, and with savings, you will get normalized financial intermediation, money moving through the banking and, to a lesser degree, the non-banking system into longer-term loans. One of the problems, again, with very short -term, low short-term rates is everybody goes for higher short-term returns because thinking about the long-term is too speculative and you don't get sustained capital formation, plants, equipment, jobs, and so forth. So again, we need to gradually normalize to a, a real rate of return for s in the savings market. And then we need, the Fed needs to step back. It needs not just to taper, it needs to reduce its portfolio so that it is no longer the key arbiter, not just of American markets, but also of global markets. It's not that, no single institution should wield that much economic power because it's not, as Paul said, it's making a lot of mistakes. It's called inflation wrong, it's called employment wrong, it's predictions about the, the resilience of the financial system were wrong. The Fed put, the, right before the 2020 crisis, the Fed put out its semi-annual financial stability report and said that the United States system, financial system was fully resilient, very res robust. It doesn't understand a lot of what it's doing, so it needs to get better. We need, a, we need a much sharper central bank with a better eye on the economy and the financial system as they are, not as they were. Thank you, thank you, Karen. And I, I smile as you talk about macro models because I, I have collected my macro theory students this very day with the representative household uh, <laughs> assumption this morning. So, uh, but uh, Paul, why don't you uh, no, close us out here? I, I um, have very, very similar feelings about, about the Fed. I, I don't know, I've been, to, since the financial crisis, puzzled by the continued short-term focus of the Fed without having really a strategic view of where one wants to be. I think if it had that kind of view, it would have been quicker to reduce quantitative easing, uh, to taper it. You referred to the taper tantrum, as it's called, in 2013, when financial markets responded uh, you know, dramatically just because the Fed didn't do anything. Bernanke <laughs> gave a speech. That's right. That was the extent of it. Uh, and they got scared off. And I, I mention it because I just had an opportunity a week ago to sort of look back at some of the data. The market response was not that great. That's right. And it wasn't really much that's of the game. That's right. Much that's of the tantrum. Right. Yep. The, you, you know, the baby sort of cried for a few minutes and, then, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> and, but nevertheless, the Fed and the, the way it was talked about, this temper tantrum, moved, for, led the Fed to not venture in that direction for another two years or so. Or so. And, that was, and, and, and I think the way Karen was, was phrasing it, that probably was a mistake. Uh, and similarly now, I don't know why they've hesitated to begin to taper QE as much as they've had in the course of this year, though it looks like in the next month or two, uh, it surely will, be, will begin. Um, so, I, so I'm often puzzled by, by uh, monetary policy, but on the, uh, and, and, and the focus of macro, you know, macro economists generally uh, on the representative agent, on the aggregate, and not under, and not really being interested in distributional results. It's sort of puzzling because all the data in your book and the data that I used in the paper on racial inequality are from the Survey of Consumer Finances, which is our primary source of data on the income and wealth of households. Who puts that together? The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And they do a, day, a very good job in doing it. It's superb quality data. It's been around for 50 years or so. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world class survey. The data are there. But the Fed, who, which was, as an institution, paying for it, didn't pay much attention to it. That's begun to change. Uh, that's begun to change. One Federal Reserve Bank after another have put into place uh, research programs on distributional issues just in the course of the last couple of years. Very good work going on in the St. Louis Fed, very good work going on in the Minneapolis Fed. 
where one of my co-authors presented our paper last week, uh, work going on in other Federal Reserve banks at the Board of Governors itself. Uh, so it's a slow-moving institution. Sometimes that's good, but in the last decade, I think we've suffered from the fact that it moves so slowly. Tapering will start in the next couple of months. That's the right direction to go. Uh, I don't see any great necessity to reduce the size of the portfolio that it has as a consequence of all the asset purchases that have taken place over the last uh, 12 years. Uh, but the continued purchasing should, should be tapered off and done away with. And some normalcy with regard to interest rates should be the strategic goal. And they haven't said that, and they should. Uh, and begin to move us in, in that direction. With respect to inequality directly, there's not much the Fed can do in terms of its tools. You know, we did do uh, some efforts to uh, direct financial resources money to individuals and small, in small business and nonprofit institutions as part of the pandemic response. But the Fed didn't have the tools to do that. Who had the tools to do that? The IRS, which knows where the people, <laughs> where individuals are. And in the spring of 2020, we threw money appropriately at households in need as part of our response to the pandemic. You know, if the, in a different institutional structure, the Fed had accounts for everybody. We could have used the Fed to do that. Fed doesn't have accounts for everybody. The IRS does, so we use the IRS to do that. It's really a fiscal decision, and who implements it was not material. What was material was getting that money out in the pandemic months of the spring of 2020, and that we did. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so we have some mi a few minutes left. I'd like to open the floor to audience questions. Uh, what we're going to do is take three of them in sequence, and then Karen and Paul will address the questions. Uh, so I'll try to point people out, but my, I don't know if I can see all the way at the back. So just go ahead and raise your hand. OK, I see one person right there. Uh -huh. Two people are right kind of in the middle. Um. So my question would be, uh, you guys talked a bit about how the Fed continually kind of messes up. That was something that you both recognized. So my question would be, um, you know, if the Fed were to try and handle wealth inequality or economic inequality broadly, um, what's the potential cost of them also messing that up? OK, so that's one. Excellent. Thank you. And then um, you talked a fair amount about no good policy with bad data. Um, would you want the Fed doing different research or more research or using a different avenue for research? How would you propose to fix that, um, that issue with the research? Okay, and then do we have a third question? Oh, okay, please. Hi, uh, first thank you both of you for uh, coming. It's been a great uh, conversation to listen to. I'd be curious. You know, as tapering begins to begin in the next two months and then the transition towards uh, an increase in fiscal policy, uh, do you see that in terms of inflation and also wealth inequality exacerbating the issue or perhaps having an effect on the real sector and really improving the overall economy? Okay, thank you. So wherever you want to start. Really great questions. Hold on, next time I say, let's ask, let's, let's get three questions. Three questions from, from women, too. This, not just all the men in the audience. The, I, I think I start with the, the second question. I, there's an increasing, I think, Paul, you're absolutely, we have old data sources, the Survey of Consumer Finances. The Fed has just been putting out something really great. They just started doing this early last year called the Distributional Financial Accounts of the United States. And it is a, fa it's a, a day, a, an amazing trove of 
unfortunately just wealth equality data. We really need a, a like-kind distributional financial analysis of income inequality, and we need, a, from a research perspective, we need to have more than two years' worth of it, but there's a, just an enormous trove of information in the DFA that is barely touched, and I think it's, it's a phenomenal research uh, resource for, for thinking about equality atop the better longitudinal data from the SCF. The, the question I think is posing, you've all posed very good questions, is how do we approach this? Because economic inequality is really complex. It's, there are many moving parts to it. And the reason I focused on monetary and banking regulatory policy is because those, I think, are perhaps the easiest. We're not going to fix globalization. We're not going to fix demography. We're not going to fix even education. If we did everything, I'm sorry, bigger Nor do we want to. Well, I think we do want to fix yeah. education. I'm not particularly no, 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 a no, fan no. of how pre K education works for poor no, no, kids. No, globalization and. I'm sorry. Okay, well, I, I think I might argue also with, with the, the old free trade paradigm, but regardless, those are some really deep structural forces. I think mm -hmm. we can make, by understanding the way financial markets, affect income and wealth, which has never been really well understood, we can then determine the policy solutions to make that process more equitable. That's, that's the direction I think we need to move in as both um, analysts and I think citizens, because we can't keep going in this direction. The K-shaped recovery we have right now, uh, I th the, an economic, I, it wouldn't take an economic historian, I think any historian will tell you that highly unequal economies are very uh, fragile political systems. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you want to remark on? Uh, you know, only to the extent to which, you know, I noted before that the Fed is a slow moving institution, which it is. Uh, it's also a strangely structured institution in the sense that there are 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. And I always say, isn't that silly? Well, it dates back to the 1913 legislation, uh, which establishes Federal Reserve Banks in the important cities of the country, like Cleveland and St. Louis. Well, they were the important industrial cities of the country in 1913. But one element of that strange structure, which is still helpful, is that researchers in these backwater places can be a little bit more imaginative and help the Fed begin to move more quickly in changing its thinking about distributional issues and making greater use of the data that, that are, are, in fact, uh, available. So, that's one thing the Fed can do. It can re re lead a research effort uh, into these, these issues. Um, what can it do directly? It can improve the regulation of the f parts of the financial sector which are under its control, which is not the whole financial sector by any means. Um, but beyond that, direct influence over inequality issues really require fiscal actions. Uh, as I interrupted, which I didn't mean to, uh, Karen, before, as she was mentioning educational issues, pre-K education, uh, improving access to student loans. These are things which require congressional action and congressional spending and are not the providence of the monetary, of, of the central bank, nor should, the, should they be. We shouldn't look to the Fed to do the things that the wimps in Congress don't seem to be able to do on their own. Okay, great. Uh, so let's, it, does it, do we have any more questions in the audience? Do we have a, a few more questions? We have one here. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I understand it, right now um, the Fed has to kind of balance um, 
I guess how how aggressively they they pursue um, um, like their full employment uh, goal and then their uh, low inflation goal. I'm, I'm kind of wondering how if they added um, if they added inequality to their mandate, like how how that could hinder their goals um, of those or those other two goals and like how do they make sure that um, they don't yeah they don't hinder those. Well, if you read the statutory language, the key acts are the Full Employment Act of 1946 and what's come to be called the Humphrey Hawkins Act of 78, and they define the Fed's charter. And the Fed has always says it has a dual mandate, and it describes that as, quote, maximum employment and price stability. But if you read the law, it's actually full employment is defined in the 46 Act as a job for anyone who wants one. And price stability is defined particularly in the 78 Act as an af the cost of consumer goods are affordable for middle class households. The third express statutory mandate is moderate interest rates. And the Fed has just conveniently ignored that. It doesn't have a dual mandate, it has a triple mandate. The law is quite clear. Now it has historically, when, when asked about it, the Fed says, well, if we do the first two, we get the third. Well, I don't quite see how it can say it done the first two, which it likes to say it has, that good place argument. When interest rates are below the zero lower bound, that's not moderate by any stretch of the imagination. So I think some the difference between fiscal and monetary policy is artificial. The Fed's charter in law is a triple mandate and if you read the law, not the Fed's version of it, and particularly the full congressional record, you'll see the Fed has an equality mandate. It's an economic equality mandate, not an education, not a trade, not a tax, not a, it's, it's, it, but it is an economic equality mandate written in black letter law. Thanks, Karen. And, and Paul, do you, do you see it the same way? Is the I equality already implied in the Fed's mandate? It's implied, but the question from the last question and an earlier statement was whether it should be made explicit with a specific metric. Um, and that's a step, in my thinking, that's a step too far because it doesn't have the variety of tools to follow so many different things at the same time. For sure, it's implicit. Um, a matter of fact, there's really four mandates. There's the original mandate to the central bank, which is the financial stability mandate dating back to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. So there are many things going on, and clearly it is within the Fed's purview to begin to pay more attention than it has. And I think that's developing but more attention than it has to distributional issues. And I think many people in the Fed have, have talked about that uh, explicitly in, in, recent, in recent years, in the last couple of years. Speeches from Jay Powell, Raphael Bostic, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta has spoken about this at, at, at length. Uh, so it is there implicitly greater consciousness about the implications of what it does for distribution is surely properly part of the game, but making an explicit inequality goal with a, a metric would be a step too far because you'd be asking the central bank to do too much at the same time with the tools that it has in hand. Well, I just add to that, I would agree with that. Because we don't even have the research. What's the metric? Is, I mean, there's a whole, what is it, the Gini correlation? Is it another just, what, I mean, what's the metric? Nobody, back to the, the very good question about research, even if I, we all agreed there should be an equality mandate, I don't mm -hmm. think anybody has a clue what an appropriate metric would be, let alone how to get there. There's just, what, there's no analytics behind anything even close to that. Well, 
on that optimistic note, there's a lot of <laughs> no. That's uh, a great optimistic research. note. Of research research you guys have done. to start working. <laughs> uh, time, time to hire some research assistants. Uh, <laughs> audience, thank you for attending. Please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>